Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone here on behalf of Rethinking Schools for our session on anti-racist teaching during the pandemic, lessons from the new teacher book. Teaching is a lifelong process and the first few years are particularly challenging. In the midst of a global pandemic and navigating virtual teaching platforms, we are all new teachers. In this moment where there are blatant attacks to education, with the presidential administration denouncing Howard Zinn and teaching people's history, critical race theory, and teaching the 1619 Project, it is imperative that we teach the truth, that we look honestly at both social injustice and the movements of resistance that light the path towards freedom and liberation, that we examine the justice system that was anything but just to Breonna Taylor that we say her name, say it loudly, and create classrooms where young people feel comfortable to process, to critically reflect, and to discuss. And so as we explore new ways of teaching and learning alongside young people, let us center social justice teaching, anti-racist teaching. Let us center relationship building to build and sustain classroom spaces, whether in person or virtual that are rooted in trust and support. Let us dream, let us strategize, and let us teach towards a more equitable world. We come together today for an opportunity to hear directly from contributors to the new teacher book, who will share stories and inspiration about how to infuse social justice teaching ideas into classrooms, schools, and communities. My name is Sierra Kaler Jones, she, her, and I am the Education and New Fellow with Teaching for Change and Communities for Just Schools Fund. I've also been an art educator for 10 years and I co-create spaces with black girls to learn and explore black history, as well as use activism and resistance. This event today is sponsored by Rethinking Schools. So I'm gonna show off my magazine here. Rethinking Schools is a nonprofit publisher and advocacy organization dedicated to sustaining and strengthening public education through teaching social justice and education activism. Their magazine, books, and other resources promote equity and racial justice in the classroom. And their quarterly magazine regularly features stories on how teachers teach a racial justice curriculum. We'll drop links to the catalog and the magazine in the chat box. For today's event, a few logistics notes. Please feel free to use the chat box to be in conversation with another to make connections. If you have a specific question for the contributors, please put them in the Q&A function so that when we get to the Q&A, we can easily identify the questions. Know that we won't be able to get to all of your questions in our time together today, but we will do our best. As we navigate technology, please bear with us amidst any technological challenges that may arise. Please also feel free to tweet about your insights throughout the conversation at Rethink Schools. And we're using the hashtag tonight, hashtag new teacher book lessons. We would love for you to continue the conversation on Twitter as well. And so we are here tonight to discuss the new teacher book and what an incredible tool and resource for new teachers, which is so many sparks that we can use both as inspiration and fuel to continue this work. I am honored to be in conversation with and to introduce our panelists for today's discussion, contributors to the new teacher book, Diane Watson, Kara Hinderly Stroman, and Ike Onyema. Diane Watson is a former high school teacher and teacher educator. Currently, she serves as the Director for Inclusion at the Oregon Episcopal School and is a Rethinking Schools editor. Some of her works include Teaching for Black Lives, Rhythm and Resistance, Teaching Poetry for Social Justice, and Rethinking Elementary Education. Kara Hinderly Stroman is a kindergarten teacher at Irvington Elementary School in Portland, Oregon. She won the Eden and Selwyn Bloom Kindergarten Children's Literature Book Award and has written articles for Rethinking Schools, including a new piece in the fall issue, which I'll ask you about in a little bit. And lastly, we have Ike Onyema as a chemistry teacher in New Jersey. 
He is also a co-founder of MAPSO Freedom School, a local organization committed to racial justice and schools. And so now we are going to dive into conversation. And to begin, I'd love to invite you, Diane, to read some of your essay, Black Boys in White Spaces. Thank you so much. So good to be here with each one of you. Right away, I recognized her, Ruby Bridges, the courageous girl who defied white racists and became the first to integrate an all-white elementary school. My seven-year-old son pulled a handout from his backpack with her face on it. As is our custom on Friday, we emptied his backpack and sorted the contents. We determined what needed to be recycled, what would be hung on our whiteboard, and what needed to be stored in my things to take care of box by the fridge. I smiled because as a former history teacher, I was happy to see my son learning about this important historical moment. Caleb, what's this about? Did you read this in school? Oh yes, her name was Ruby Bridges and they wouldn't allow her to go to school with the white people. That's so cool that you learned about her. I learned about her too. Yes, but mama, I shouldn't have been there that day. I frowned and looked him in his eyes. Why not? What do you mean? Everyone stared at me when, I, when we read it because I'm the only black kid in my class. Oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. What did the teacher do? What did she say? Nothing. Did anybody say anything to you? No, they just stared at me. I didn't like it. I didn't know what to say. My eyes welled up with tears. I put my arm around him as I tried to figure out what reaction would best serve him. Should I show my anger? Do I simply weep and say nothing? Should I offer him a snack and ignore it altogether? I was so disappointed in my lack of words and that I didn't know what to do in that moment. It wasn't a secret to Caleb that we're black and that on some level that makes us different than most of the people around us. We attend a white church, we live in a white neighborhood, we shop in white stores. So far, I haven't had any planned conversations about race with my boys. Not sure what I'm waiting for or even that I am waiting. Race is funny that way. As a reality, it's ever present. As a topic, it slips in and out of our lives, attaching to everyday things like hair and clothes, to speaking, to how my boys comport themselves in a grocery store. No, race is not a stranger to us, and, and we talk about it. But in this moment, with my little boy expressing his sadness and feeling invisible, yet overly seen, I was speechless. And then I was sad. And then I was angry. New teachers, here's what I wished would have happened instead. I wish Caleb's response to my enthusiasm about him learning a moment in Black history would have been him saying in his own excited voice, and you know what else we learned? We learned that even though there are white people who didn't want Ruby Bridges in that school, there were some who did. I wish his teacher told him about allies, about the various people of all races committing to stand up against injustice. I wish the teacher noticed everyone staring at my son. I wish that she would have explicitly prepared the class for an age appropriate conversation about skin, skin color, race, and difference. I wish I felt comfortable asking him my customary, and how'd that make you feel? But I was afraid of his response and my reaction. You know, being black doesn't mean I have all the answers when it comes to race. But it does mean that I often find myself thinking differently about what happens in the classroom than some of my children's teachers. If the teacher had been more thoughtful about the implementation of the lesson, maybe his answer would be that he felt good. Maybe he would have felt validated if his teacher had talked with him prior to the lesson and explained that sometimes when we're the only one, it can feel lonely and embarrassing, but that she was there that she cared about him, that she would protect him. And of course, if race was an everyday topic and every kid knew that they had one, Caleb would not have felt alone and singled out. Don't misunderstand me. I do not join the chorus of folks who call teachers incompetent, lazy, or anything that categorizes teachers in a collective negative light. No, this teacher is thoughtful and definitely cares about my son, but she was not skillful in this circumstance. And in this instance, in the area of race, teaching, learning, and belonging, love is not enough. There are lots of teachers who love their students, but do not understand the ways in which race mediates teaching and learning. 
So I think, well, do I just let it go? Do I hold that against her? No, I choose to forgive her. But I will also hold her accountable for the learning that took place that day and the learning that should have taken place that day. I want Nehemiah and Caleb, my black sons, to be free to dream, to go to bed with nothing on their minds but how much they are loved and cared for. Black boys deserve to be boys, to be young, carefree, and nurtured, to be seen as human, capable of being hurt, bullied, and afraid. They deserve a school system that will educate them with intentional love. They deserve teachers who will hold the learning space as sacred in all aspects and think through who their students are as they plan lessons and activities. We all deserve schools that will think about how race plays with learning, everyone's learning. White students especially deserve to have teachers who will empower them as white allies. When I asked Caleb how his day went, at some point he answered, I shouldn't have been there that day. The truth is, no one should have been there. For no student, Latinx, white, Asian, indigenous, or black, was served well that day. At the same time, he should have been there. I just wish he was better served and felt like he belonged. Oh, I've read that piece a, a number of times and every time it, it gives me chills and it brings up such a critical perspective and the necessary reminder, Diane, that even as we might commit to being anti-racist educators, that we can not solely add in curriculum and stories, that we have to build strong relationships with young people, as you recommend, in order to prepare the class for age appropriate conversations about difference. We have to share the stories of allies. I love that you mentioned that, to reinforce how we all play a role in anti-racism and social justice and how we have to approach our pedagogy, not just with love, but intentional love coupled with skill. And that part of the piece really gets me every time. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you, Sierra. Next, Cara, I would love to turn to you to hear your reflections and then invite you to read some of your piece, Black is Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. I, I just saw my preschool teacher was on here from Cambridge, Mass. I'm all the way over in Portland, so that was cool. So hello. Um, I will share a piece of the article that is in um, the new teacher handbook. and. Um, it's long, so I'm not going to do too much reflection on it, actually. So, in my white kindergarten class, I see the few black boys targeted as the ones who did something wrong, as the kids who are called mean, as the kids who are not named as a friend. I see my one black girl sad on the playground or looking for a spot at the table with her white peers, unsure how to make space for herself. They are on the periphery of play usually the it in tag, and it reminds me of my own story. Like in high school, when the teacher told us that in our society, the color black symbolizes black and evil, and white symbolizes good and pure. Well, one day at work, um, I came across a stack of books that was outside the library, marked free books, and it were two copies of Black is Beautiful. It was published in the 70s by Anne McGovern, and made up of black and white photos um, of simple objects, a black bird, black jelly beans, black puppies, a black butterfly, a young black girl in dress up. The words in the book were written like a free verse poem. I loved the simplicity and took both copies to use in my classroom. And side note, I took them both because one looked like it was falling apart. <laughs> um, the students listened to me read aloud using a voice of wonderment and adoration. Some pages I whispered in reverence. I stopped at the page of the black girl playing dress up in her mom's clothes, the only page mentioning black skin being beautiful. Do you see her wearing her mama's fancy clothes? I said, so beautiful and fun. When I finished, I asked what they noticed in the book. I noticed the pictures only had black. I noticed a blackbird. I noticed beautiful. The horse was black. I noticed candy. Yeah, the class responds in a chorus of agreement. 
I wrote down what they noticed on chart paper and then I asked, what well, can we add to this Black is Beautiful book that the author didn't mention? The tire swing, Chris said. Some people may not see a tire swing is beautiful. How can we can convince them that, that it is? I think about how some of you love to push it and some of you love to ride on the tire swing. Hmm. What would some beautiful movement words be that you could say with tire swing? It twirls, it spins around and around. Ooh, I can't wait to see how you write that. I smiled. I noticed this author wrote this book like poetry to help us remember how beautiful the things in the book are. What words and descriptions can we add to our ideas to make people see the beauty and goodness of the color black? My dress is soft and cozy. Laura gently patted her black fuzzy skirt, smiling into her own shoulder. Nadira, who had been gazing away, raised her hand. Blackbird floating in a black sky. I wrote what they said on the board and asked them to tell a friend three black things they were going to write about in a beautiful way. I know some will only get a picture or a word down and some will fill the page, but I want them all to start by telling someone three things. It gives them a goal and sets the expectation with a starting point. I send them off to write their ideas and have Black is Beautiful written on sentence strips at each writing table for reference. The next day we reviewed, who remembers something that is Black and Beautiful? Horses, birds, sneakers, rain clouds. Yes, I said. Today we're gonna to look at a different kind of Black is Beautiful. We know that there are things that are Black and Beautiful and people who are Black and Beautiful, but it can be a little confusing because is people's skin the color of Black paper or a Black shirt? No, Black people are all different shades of brown. We just call it Black sometimes. Today we're gonna to write about beautiful Black people and I have a few books to share with you to give you ideas. I start by reading My People by Langston Hughes. Sunshines, I love this book, I told my students. The words in this book are so simple and so powerful. This book is actually a short poem that was stretched across the photographs, so the pages, so the photographs could illustrate each line of the poem. When I read this poem to you, I want you to study the pictures as you hear the words that I say. Look at the faces and the features of these black people and notice their beauty. Notice what Langston compares the beauty to. In one place, he compares me to the sun. I always feel so great when I read this poem. I'm explicit when I talk to the students about the metaphors in Langston Hughes' poem. It's hard to understand when you're five years old and the world is a literal concrete place. Some do not make the connection I want them to make. They are not thinking about the black people of the poem, but of their metaphors is beautiful, the stars and the sun. So I make the connection for them and carry them with me through the example. Now you can understand why I love this poem. Langston compares beautiful people with the sun and stars. Look at this page. I showed them the page of an elderly man, his face raised and smiling at something unseen to the reader. When I look at this page, I see joy and happiness. I see lines around his mouth that says he smiles a lot. His skin looks so soft to touch. That's why he looks beautiful to me. And I think that's why they chose this picture to go with the word also in the poem. Sometimes we think of beauty one way and then discover, like in this book, there are other ways that we can see beauty. Next, I tell my kids why it's important to celebrate Black history. I tell them my story of learning about history where no one looked like me or my family. We have Black History Month as a reminder to teachers that there's not much written about all of the things that black and brown people have contributed to our lives. When I was a kid, I only learned about the ways white people changed our lives. There are no books or activities in our school that let us know um, who those black people were or how they affected the way we lived. I will share inventors and leaders who paved the way or made important discovery through diligence and hard work. They seemed intrigued, some looked surprised, some look totally bored. Buy into the unknown is hard, but I gave them some examples. Then I told them mostly about inventors and real firsts um, because they're the most tangible for young learners to understand. It's a clear, concrete contribution to the bettering of our daily lives. Refrigeration, open heart surgery, stoplights, peanut butter. I want my students to have a basis for appreciating Black people. So later, 
when they learn about the more complex concepts of slavery, Jim Crow, and civil rights, somewhere in the back of their mind, I hope they will remember the beauty of Black and the ways Black people made life better for them. And then maybe in front of their eyes, they will see the injustice for what it was and what it still is. And I'll stop there. The last section is a short um, snippet of, a, of resistance when parents complain or um, kids seem resistant to the work. But I will sh let you enjoy that when you get your hands on this awesome book. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, Tara, thank you so much. This piece makes me so emotional. The messages that we share with young people stay with them for a lifetime. And you have so beautifully and authentically shown us what that looks like. I love how you explicitly talk about metaphors with five-year-olds. But you talk about them with, as you said, a voice of wonderment and adoration, really seeing the beauty in all things black, the joy, the happiness, but scaffolding for those conversations to come about injustice. And with so much pain in the world, how, how do we as social justice educators, as anti-racist teachers, teach about the beauty and the joy coupled with teaching about the resistance and the injustice? Thank you so much, Cara. E.K. I am so looking forward to hearing you share your work from outrage to organizing. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Sierra. Uh, once again, I'm E.K. Chukwu Onyema, um, reading to you from New Jersey, which is indeed uh, originally Lenape land. That's L-E-N-A-P-E -E land uh, before colonization. Um, also representative of Mapso Freedom School. Uh, I'll be reading from my piece in the new teacher book, which is indeed entitled From Outrage to Organizing, Building Community Ties Through Education Activism. Um, freedom schools, freedom schools have taken many forms over the years, but all evoke the legacy and militancy of the civil rights movement. In their earliest iterations, they functioned as liberated spaces for political education and literacy interventions inside of churches or in community centers over the summer. Uh, this was certainly our inspiration when our group of educators and activists embarked on an organizing mission in response to a confrontation between police and student youth that transpired on July 5, 2016, in our community of Maplewood, South Orange, New Jersey. On that day, several African American teenagers experienced the violence and disrespect from police officers that is a pervasive fact of life for young people of color. After Fourth of July festivities in the local park, police were summoned to clear the area. As the crowd dispersed, a group of African-American teenagers sought to return home to their families in this diverse and affluent suburb. Yet, police prevented them from doing so. Assuming that they must be residents of a working class urban town nearby, the police herded the youth in that direction. The pleas and protests from the local teenagers fell on deaf ears while the police proceeded to scream obscenities as if to provoke the students into behavior that might justify escalated police force. The confrontation reflected the pattern of disproportionately harsh treatment of Black youth by police that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. <clears throat> the incident touched a nerve in this multiracial community of about 40,000 people T.J. Whitaker, a local veteran high school English teacher and African-American activist in the community, had an established reputation uh, and students believed they could confide in him. Uh, upon hearing student testimony, T.J. quickly reached out to other activists and educators to assist with a meaningful response. 
I'm not done reading yet, but I want to pause there and say that what I've heard read so far, uh, especially by Kara, about the impact that teachers can have on their students inside the classroom translates outside of the classroom. When these kinds of routine and unfortunately mundane, uh, but yet violent experiences with the police happen, is when we set the foundation, uh, we prepare students so that they have someone to turn to. Uh, in this case, it was TJ Whitaker who then reached out to a larger cadre of educators. Um, after TJ reached out, to the broader cadre of educators that's currently placed on the screen. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we took some action. Uh, there was a local organization in our community, I won't say their name at this time, but honestly, they had a reputation for meekly addressing these kinds of instances of racism. In response to the assault, the group convened a conversation at a local school. At this event, some student voices were heard, but the overall thrust was to extol the virtues of the police for their role in protecting community safety. TJ was outraged by the narrative reversal of blame and responsibility. The need for a stronger response was deeply felt. Thus, when, Okai when Okaikor R.E.A. Price, Dr. Okaikor R.E.A. Price, my friend and fellow educator suggested a freedom school as an effective response, it resonated with many educators in the audience who silently nodded at each other in approval. Fortunately, for the majority of educators who decided to get involved, this transpired in the summer and we had time to dedicate to regular meetings. We met in TJ's living room to plan out our first event, a day of activities that we hoped would deepen the conversation on race and invoke the activist participatory spirit of the Freedom Schools. Uh, students, parents, and educators planned the event together. Um, I just want to pause and say, oftentimes when I tell folks that I'm a co-founder of MAPSO Freedom School, they often wonder, is, you know, is the Freedom School a brick and mortar building? Um, and, and, and the truth is no, it began in uh, one of our comrades' living rooms and we show up um, where we can and how we need to show up. I'll continue reading. Uh, for one session, I co-taught a Know Your Rights workshop for the rising senior high school student, Xavier. I learned a lot from Xavier as we planned. What's a great way for us to engage our workshop participants when they first walk in, I asked. Something that my history teacher often uses are political cartoons, Xavier replied. As a science teacher, I wasn't accustomed to incorporating these into my lesson. Uh, he emailed me some samples later on that evening. When we implemented them in the workshop, the results were incredible. The students and parents who attended enjoyed parsing the implied and layered messages in the cartoons. In one cartoon titled The Talk, there were two images of a father conversing with his son about the most critical issue they may encounter as, a, as adolescents. In one image, the father and son were black. In the other, they were white. The white parent was speaking to his son about the birds and the bees, while the black parent was speaking to his son about how to interact with the police. Um, I'll pause there. There's a lot more uh, to what I've written, and I talk about my connections, not only with MAPSO Freedom School, but also how we sought to collaborate with the teachers union to uh, impact both our community and the union in the process of organizing for racial justice. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, EK. Just, ah, the mention of freedom schools and the legacy and the militancy of the civil rights movement and creating liberated spaces really highlights and illuminates the powerful organizing of educators that translates outside of the classroom. Uh, I appreciate how you showed all of us how important it is to show up, show up for ourselves, for each other as educators, for the young people, and for social justice because it impacts all of us. What I love is that MAPSO shows us what is possible. As many folks now are having conversations about reimagining education, organizers have shown us what is possible. So how do we keep fighting for those dreams and for those liberatory spaces? Powerful, thank you so much, EK. And so now I'm going to ask the panelists some questions. And I actually saw a question in the Q&A that I would, would love to surface first because I think that it's very relevant to our conversation today. And so 
as I look at the panelists, what makes pedagogy anti-racist? Um, I can start the conversation. I think um, anti-racist pedagogy or and um, curriculum designing is very intentional. Um, it's a very, it can be a very personal work. Um, and that in order to cultivate a active pedagogy that's constantly evolving, that's, that's where you're trying to stay aware in, um, in the present with the work um, is a big way that it will, it can help to become anti-racist. I don't know if I said that clearly, but um, for me, when I am picking a read aloud for the five-year-olds, I'm thinking, what's happening in the world right now? How is this relevant to my black and brown kiddos? Um, what will the impact be for them or their families when I'm reading this book? Um, what will the impact be on the lesson in general? What um, wisdom can I impart during a school day um, that aren't necessarily giant big pieces, but little bits that together, um, when you add them all together, that they are um, impactful. Um, and also, you know, I don't think it's a one-stop shop kind of a deal uh, being anti-racist. I think it's a um, long journey that if you ask yourself these questions on a regular basis, then um, it will evolve and become stronger. Um, yeah, that, oh, go. Oh, are you sure? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually want to begin the answer to that question again, first by saying, uh, while of course I'm here speaking, again, I'm here representing all of the insights that I've gained over the years of organizing alongside other educators who are committed to anti racist education. Uh, it's not something that should be embarked upon alone or singularly. Um, like as if, you know, a Lone Ranger approach, as I, I was once told when I started organizing. Uh, so first, please be collaborative, reach out uh, within your school walls and beyond your school walls. Um, and again, I have to shout out my MAPSO crew. Um, second, though, I'm so inspired by the readings that I heard from Diane and Cara. And I want to say that it, it's at the center of anti-racist teaching. It really is self-love, as like corny and meek as that may sound. It, it really is. When I heard, you know, Cara, you know, sharing Langston and Hughes's lyrics about, you know, comparing our skin to that of being kissed by the sun and just the various shades um, as a scaffolding to get ready for the more rigorous and serious discussions about, you know, not just our oppression, but our resistance. I mean, it has to begin, I think, with self-love. Um, and, you know, I'll also say that uh, I've, I've, I've seen I've seen approaches to anti-racist education um, that sometimes can devolve into, um, you know, calling out bias and prejudice, which is important. But what I sometimes notice is that there's an absence of a power analysis, and especially its institutional and historical relevance, uh, such that, you know, we, find, we, we can find ourselves mistakenly calling anti-racist education the kind of education that labels anybody who exhibits any kind of bias or prejudice racist, um, which, is, which is absent of a power analysis historically uh, and, and institutionally. Who has historically had power? Um, and so we have, when we're talking about anti-racist education, uh, we can't leave out conversations around white supremacy. We certainly can't leave out conversations around a class analysis as well. Um, and I, I'll just end by saying, in a, that's one way I've seen it kind of go, the, go in a questionable way. I've also seen it go in a questionable way by folks who maybe had good intentions. I don't know. But um, what, we, what we don't want it to look like, maybe here's like a not to do list as well, is uh, for example, I, I'll just share a scenario where I heard of a, a teacher who literally uh, carried out the ritual of a slave auction in her classroom. Um, you know, imagine how you're, you know, re-traumatizing the students um, who, 
who have had ancestors who went through that same thing. Uh, you, you don't need to, to revisit violence upon people. It's not anti-racist teaching. Uh, so I just wanna just to offer some of those cues. Yeah, I agree with both, um, with, with, with what each of you have said. Um, and I think one of the things that folks gotta remember that it doesn't happen by accident. It has to be purposeful and intentioned. And you know, if you are against something, right, the anti-racism, then, then what are you for? And I think that's also something that, that teachers might forget that they think, oh, I'll just sprinkle in, you know, Japanese incarceration or a little bit here, or in my math class, I'm gonna put quote unquote, ethnic names in it. And that's anti-racist, right? No, it is not. And it's about what Ike was saying about the power. It's about self-love. It's about saying, I'm not just against racism, but I am for what? I'm for teaching about oppression and how the system that we are a part of is is inherently biased and racist and what does that mean what does that look like and and what part do i play in that and what part do we want to teach kids how to resist like how can we teach little ones to be little resistors right and co-conspirators in this and to me that's more of where i want folks to move to in terms of you know what an anti-racist curriculum would look like Thank you all. Wow. I just, uh, oof, so good. I'm just hearing so many things from how curriculum is intentional. It's personal to so being an anti-racist educator is an ongoing commitment. I saw something somewhere that said being an anti-racist educator is not an identity or a checklist, right? It is that ongoing commitment to doing this work. And just like you said, Diane, anti means against. So what are we for? Oh, yes. As we analyze the power historically and institutionally. And so as educators brave new virtual platforms and nav navigate a whole host of either hybrid, remote, or possibly even in-person instruction with social distancing, we're all new educators in this sense. And so what suggestions do you have for educators to center anti-racist teaching and to not lose sight of its necessity while teaching in new ways? Um, I don't, I don't mind kicking off this one. Kari, you did the last one. Um, so thank you for that question. And it actually kind of harkens to another question that I saw in the Q and A. I'm trying to scroll through it. There's so many awesome questions in here. And this one might've been tailored for me as well. Like what are some ways that I discuss race in, in a chemistry classroom? Um, and indeed we are all new teachers in this totally new world, this new environment as we began this new school year. Um, so I'll, I'll just share a few things that I've done um, a little bit more concretely. And, and again, I'll, I'm going to continue to say this at the risk of being a broken record, but anti-racist education is not something that I do individually. Uh, so I have my MAPSO crew, the MAPSO Freedom School, but especially as a result of this tumultuous and just tension-filled summer, there were a group of other science educators uh, nearby in PA and Philly who I just happened to connect with. And we said, you know, we're going to meet a few times over the summer and try to keep this going throughout the school year. And we're, we're identifying ourselves as a group of anti-racist STEAM teachers. Uh, but the purpose is really first to acknowledge that as STEAM teachers, we haven't often embraced the challenge of engaging conversations around race in our classroom. It's just I think science has this false veneer of objectivity and that race doesn't have a role or, or a place in it, which is a flat out lie. And in fact, an intentional lie to continue perpetuating the ways that injustice occurs in science related and, medical, and medically related fields. So that's a very intentional lie uh, with the cause and the, and the effect of, of, of inducing harm. Um, so I want to say that first. I organize, and, I, and I'm with. I'm in collaboration with other teachers. Um, but number two, like something I tried this year. Again, I'm teaching over Google Meet this year. I, some of my students, I haven't. I can't remember their faces. Some of them don't even have their cameras on. But I knew that I was going to set an intention about discussing race. One of the first things I did in the first few days of my particular class was there was a list from 
uh, actually the American Chemical Society, which is actually an awesome organization, just a plug, but they had this really cool article about nine black chemists that you should know. And they were like these one or two paragraph vignettes um, about their biographies and their uh, accomplishments. Guess what? I shared that with my students and I invited them, just pick one out of those nine chemists. And again, I didn't know where this was gonna go, but I said, look, just imagine what they might do on like a random summer's day. You have an appreciation of their family background and their, their scientific achievements. How might they spend a regular summer's day? You know, our summer vacation just wrapped up. And to hear students imagining, hmm, they might actually take that time to go to a museum and continue to deepen their research in this area of study or they might actually go back into the lab in the summer, um, or they might be celebrating one of their accomplishments or achievements. It, again, it reminds me again about what Cara was saying about how important it is just to celebrate ourselves because, um, you know, whether it's anti-racist teaching or the history of oppression, especially in science-related fields, it's not totally one of, of oppression. There has been achievement, there has been resistance, um, but then I succeeded that. Uh, I saw a headline recently, some of the others may have seen it as well, about um, the alleged hysterectomies that have been happening in the ICE facility, uh, in a particular ICE facility in Georgia. And I thought, well, that's going to have to enter my class too. Um, that it's, it's, a, a, it's just unethical and it's wrong and it's immoral. It doesn't always have to connect directly to science and chemistry. I'm bringing it up first and foremost because it matters. Next, I'm going to talk about our ethical responsibility as people who study science. It's not enough for you to be uh, so facile with the, with the content knowledge that we're learning here, but you, know, you haven't wrestled with your moral and ethical obligations such that uh, you, know, you become a medical professional in the future. And this is the kind of thing that either you're witnessing or perhaps even carrying out with your, with your knowledge. So uh, I had to have that conversation as well with my students. Is it always clean? No. Um, are there are there going to be moments of silence? Yes. You know, am I kind of poking and prodding and figuring out better ways to have these discussions? Yes. Um, you know, I brought up the idea. You know, the definition of eugenics and uh, and the history in this country. So again, I'm talking a lot, but I just wanted to share that. So thank you. So I think what it looks like is just busting out of the box of normal, quote unquote, normal education, right? So like the schedule, uh, just at, at Oregon Episcopal School, just today I was talking to uh, the head of the upper school and she was talking about how we are rearranging the schedule to make it work for students, to make it work for social justice, right? But providing that time to um, have kids get together in ways that they wouldn't normally get together. Um, I think that if you're teaching younger kids, this is the perfect time to be subversive and actually teach their parents, right? Because I'm thinking about all the times I'm running into my eight-year-old's uh, workspace, his, his classroom, and um, learn about you know monkeys and dinosaurs and whatever, <laughs> and this is a great time to have me as a parent, you know, over his shoulder go, wait, what's this? What's this about about whiteness? What is that? And so to me, that's really what we should be doing during this time. It's teaching things that uh, we always should be teaching, but be thinking the parents are in the room literally, and how can we partner with them um, to to be to, to help educate their children. Uh, so that's my first thought in terms of what could it look like in terms of uh, the pandemic. Um, thank you for saying that about scheduling because um, it's a beast online, especially I have five-year-olds. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, a couple of stories come to mind when I think about um, online teaching right now. And one of them that's actually surprised me was um, we have a shared resource right now that is all across our district and probably beyond. I haven't investigated too carefully, but everybody's lessons are available who put them on to see. And I was really impressed how many people started with um, you know, anti-racist books. And again, like EK says, it's not about having one thing or being solid, but I was 
feeling very isolated. And I know EK was also saying like, it's not a lone wolf situation, but it kind of sometimes depends on your environment and you do have to actively seek your, your crew, um, even if they're not in your immediate spaces all the time. Um, and, um, but I, I felt, a little bit of my load lightened that I could, that someone else has, is taking the time to find these um, materials and resources and putting them together in ways, and I can either use them directly or I can adapt them um, and vice versa. I can put them on this, on this um, app or this site uh, for teaching and then it is available for other people to use. Um, and I was also thinking of um, a friend of mine who is a mom and she's Guatemalan and she decided to homeschool um, and she posted this picture um, and she was so excited if her children were building um, the boats of that came for Christopher Columbus and and I was floored and dismayed she's Guatemalan and she's like hey Christopher Columbus discovered America so there's definitely room for like educating and making things available so that people aren't making um, mistakes and errors when they're working with the children. Um, I also do agree about having parent involvement, especially with five-year-olds, it's huge because they don't even know the off button. They're still learning where the mute button is, the off button, if they're on screen or not. Um, and uh, I find myself doing a lot of, um, of relying on parents, but also having to let them know like, if your kid is being a noodle, they're five. They're supposed to be a noodle. It's okay. Let them noodle. You know, you don't have to correct them. It might be time to go. Um, and that's where my scheduling comes in is that if I'm seeing that they're done, then um, we are done. So um, I don't know if I answered it all the way, but those were the three things that stood out in my mind. Such powerful reflections. And so I have a, a couple of follow-up questions for each of you, and I see them also coming through the Q&A as well. So we feel very synergized with, with all of y'all that are, that are calling in all over the country and the world. And so Diana, I wanna ask you a question first because you brought up a really important point about the involvement of parents in online teaching and remote learning. And so what advice do you have for educators who receive pushback? on anti-racist teaching from parents, from colleagues and administrators, especially in teaching virtual spaces where learning is happening at home? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, if you're a public school, you can probably go to the state standards. It depends on your state. I mean, Oregon redid the standards um, just recently, but even a few years ago when they redid them, they're pretty, pretty radical. I mean, well, radical for standards. <laughs> Not radical in that it's what you should have been teaching all along. And so I always told my, my teacher candidates, hey, go to the standards. The standards say I'm supposed to teach this, so this is what I'm going to teach. If, if your standards are terrible, what's the mission of the school? What's the mission of the school district? You know, almost every school now has some kind of, you know, social justice, anti-racist, some kind of component in there. And so I would say, well, this is how I am achieving these goals. This is how I'm working toward those goals. Um, you know, you could even ask, do you have other suggestions that will help me get to these goals? Because the thing is, if, if the school district has said, this is what we're supposed to learn, then you're doing exactly what the school district has asked. And so it's a good way to kind of like, you know, push it off on someone else and uh, let the higher ups fight that battle for you. Another way is to get um, parents engaged in ways that really make um, the work about being home. So asking students um, to, with their parents, gather all of the uh, fiction books you have in the house and put them in a pile or piles and go through them and count how many are by uh, authors of color, how many are, you know, these various things. And I think that a lot of parents will start to go, oh, and really think about what they're teaching their kids. And so we make it just more of reality, like, you know what, we gotta start somewhere and in your own home, you are reinforcing whiteness, or maybe you're not, I mean, that would be the beauty if you're not. Um, then I think maybe some parents will, will back off just a little. <clears throat> mm, thank you for that really tangible advice. I can, see so many folks in the chat commenting about how they can use those strategies tomorrow. 
And so, Kara, I'm going to turn to you next. We are in the midst of a rebellion against white supremacy and anti-Blackness, and it's imperative that we teach about the long history of white supremacy, as you will have all shared with us today the importance but also teach about the powerful resistance to oppression. So I would love to hear more about how, as a, as a kindergarten teacher, what advice do you have for early childhood educators to engage in these critical conversations in developmentally appropriate ways? And I know that you have a, a new piece coming out on the fall issue, so maybe you can forecast that for all of us. <laughs> Plug, okay. Um, relationship. Um, my relationship that I form with my students is um, my key ingredient in teaching. Um, and not only just my relationship in terms of me saying, hi, how are you? I love you. I'm glad you're here. But the, the trust that they, that I develop with them because I have a consistent routine, um, I have consistent responses. Um, so that they can look at me and not have anxiety about what is going to happen if I bring this to you, right? So um, for little kids, you know, all children learn through their emotional filter. And so if if your relationship is strained, then the amount that they receive from you education-wise is going to be less than if um, they know you're wide open and they're wide open to you. Uh, that's where all the room is. It's, it's over 90% that you filter through your emotion. Um, so I start there. I try to make sure that um, I am immersing them in really great literature, kind of like what Diane was saying, like get all your books down and see what, what's represented there. And um, it's a very rich classroom, it's very rich. Um, you know, visually, I just keep it very interesting. So, um, and then the second piece is in order to tackle that big topic, I have, we have that background. Um, and I may build up to something like you were saying, scaffolding um, the lesson so I can say, hey, remember when we did this activity? Um, well, now we're gonna apply it in a real life situation and I think, um, one of the stories that I tell in the article um, that's coming out is just that. It was a very simple um, activity that we do where we learn about our names and where our name stories and where they come from. Um, and we do name art. And then um, with the protests that started after George Floyd's murder, um, and we're, you know, as a Black teacher, I'm raw and it's online and I'm not sure what to do, but I start with, okay, what have we done? We've just finished a Black is Beautiful unit. They've just done these amazing poems. We've been talking about all the Black contributions. So I know that they're on board. Um, and in the beginning of the year, we did a name unit that was our name. So how about we say their name? How about we take this, what we know, and we say, this is our time. This is why we do it, <laughs> you know? This is, it wasn't just in the past. It's right here in our lap let's take advantage of it. And it was a really small step, but I was really vulnerable and fragile at that time. And that was what I had. That was my energy that I had to give at that time. Um, and so that, that is um, probably a good example of one of the things. And the, the upshot of that was I had a grandmother come and say, there's, um, you know, uh, some elderly people had uh, motivated and were protesting they were calling it lunch protest and they go out on this kind of little busy corridor over by my school and they all they dress in all black and they and they hold up their black lives matter signs say their name signs their brianna taylor signs and she came she said i didn't even know about it until my granddaughter came to me and showed me her brianna sign <laughs> and Thank you, thank you for teaching my child this and having her come back and tell me all about this. Um, I would have known how to start that conversation. And so I think that's another way that we really are impactful on our families is that um, they, don't, they, they don't always know how to start and they're afraid of it, um, especially when they're not black and they don't have to look at it. Uh, they can walk away from it. And so this is a, just a very clear way that we are impacting um, our communities. Sorry, I'm a crier. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. Just in this moment on today, how we all need that lesson. 
um, and how you have beautifully created the space for the young people that you work with to learn, but to also share and how in our roles as educators, we show up in that way, not just for the young people, but for all of the people that love the young people that we also love and that we also have the opportunity and the privilege to teach. So thank you for that great change work that you're doing. EK, I'm going to turn to you now. And so how can teachers hold space for other teachers to not only have conversations about anti-racist pedagogy, but also support one another in mobilizing and organizing for social justice? I see some a question that came up in the, in the Q&A very much relevant to the conversation that we're having today of how can educators organize to show up especially in this moment when there are blatant attacks to social justice education and there's still injustice that plagues our society. How can we show up in this way for each other as educators? How can we organize and how can we mobilize? Um, wow, thank you so much for that question, Sierra. It is, uh, th there is so much activity happening in the chat that I want to respond to. Um, and I'm trying to discipline myself to stick to the questions I'm being asked. But I also want to say how grateful I am both for Kara's refre reflections and her tears of strength, as well as what Diane said about parents and how we can engage them if we are questioned. Uh, I couldn't help but refer, she encouraged us to look at our standards. I couldn't help but refer to uh, some of the standards in the next generation science standards and these are not state specific if your state has adopted them then these are then they supply for you as well no matter which subject of science you teach but i mean some of these cross-cutting concepts uh as a scientist you have to study cause and effect you have to study systems and system models you have to study stability and change you have to study scale proportion and quantity um this is in integral to studying science. And what better way to make these real and tangible for our students than to bring in anti-racist teaching? I mean, it, it, frankly, if you ask me, it gets to the point where we have to ask teachers who aren't bringing it in why they're not bringing it in, because it's such a powerful and effective way to hit our standards. Um, and so as important as it is to be able to defend what we do, uh, after defending what we do, we need to push back and get right back on the offense and say, now, why aren't y'all doing this? Um, so I just, I just had to say that. Uh, but, you know, back to the question about how teachers can, uh, can organize and mobilize uh, in this particular moment. Um, I want to share that one of the, like, founding documents for MAPSO Freedom School has been a document called um, Organi Organization Means Commitment. It was written anonym anonymously in the 1970s. Uh, and then more recently, uh, the author revealed herself to be the one and only the Grace Lee Boggs, uh, Grace Lee Boggs, who is now uh, transitioned and no longer with us. Um, but this was a founding document for us because when we came together, we had to ensure, <laughs> if you will, that we were like on the same page um, politically and philosophically. So a lot of us come to this work um, out of a sense of anger. We, we, we're actually, we're reacting sometimes. And, and I really don't mean that in an offensive way. I'm trying to describe what I've observed actually happen. So folks are motivated. Uh, folks are ready to act. Uh, folks show up and hit the streets. Folks design, um, you know, your protest signs and you hit the rallies and you give the fiery speeches. I've seen that and that's important, it has its place, but Grace Lee Boggs wrote this in the 70s after a very turbulent 60s, 1960s and 1970s, um, particularly after the Black Panthers. And she also observed that while, we are, um, while, there, were, while there were a lot of folks who were just, who were very animated, not many of them were, were, were able or prepared to actually do the organizing work uh, that, that, was, that was frankly most needed. Um, she talks about uh, 
overnight, it seemed like uh, there were th these very visible, very visible defiance uh, turned this new party into a mass party attracting thousands of angry young uh, blacks ready to confront, you know, like the pigs. That's important. But she says that she wrote organi organization means commitment to project a very different con concept of, ver of revolutionary organization and leadership. What is that very different concept? She said, how many of us uh, could sit down and work out a program with just a half a dozen people that could carry out over the period of a year? Let me just say that again. Like, How many of us can get together with just a handful of people? You don't need a thousand. You don't need a hundred. You don't even need 10. Just a handful of people that have a similar mindset than you and y'all can stick together for a year. That, that was her purpose. It, she actually had a what some might call a very small goal. I mean, when we think about revolution, sometimes we think of this large transformative thing. We have to overturn, like turn this whole planet Earth upside down. But she's saying, I'm actually proposing a very different concept of what revolution can look like. How many of you can get together with your comrades and meet regularly enough for just a year? So, when, so, so as teachers, uh, as we as we get in this work and we decide to do the the organizing and the mobilizing, I want to I want to draw a very stark distinction between mobilizing and organizing. Mobilizing is what we do at the protests. Organizing is what we do in between the protests. To be very real, it's a lot harder. It's a lot tougher to sustain. If all you have is the energy from the protest and that's it, no deeper analysis, no willingness to commit and organize and and compromise and sacrifice with other people toward a common goal, you're not actually organizing. You're mobilizing. And the issue with mobilizing is that you're just gonna be reacting, frankly, for the rest of your life. You're gonna be, re and, and that's tired. That's actually tiresome. I'd rather do the sustainable work of, get, of gearing up and, and trying to figure out, okay, so um, some of the pictures that were shown while, and I know I'm going a little long, almost done. Um, but some of the uh, pictures that might have been shown while I was reading my excerpt, you might have seen us at a rally. And yes, we have rallies. We have to do, we have to hit the streets. But as we were promoting the importance of the six demands uh, from the Black Lives Matter School Week of Action, um, we, we said it's not enough to go to a protest and declare how important these demands are. We got to figure out ways to bring them into fruition. So we've been meeting in between the protests afterward. And the number of the folks who attended the protests and the number of folks who are meeting afterward to figure out how to make this tangible, those are very two different numbers. And frankly, that's what I anticipate. But I mean, that, I hope that's helpful and I really am not coming from a spirit of criticism right now. Just, just sharing my experience uh, really with love uh, that I'll pass. Mm, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, EK. And what, what strategy, what advice you have given us all to think about about how we can support one another but how we can support young people and how we can support this work this world that we need to do and how we can organize and make sure that this world the world that we all deserve to live in is achieved and so a question that i'm seeing come up in the q a which is also one of the questions that i have for you all as well is thinking about the, the stress around teaching in new virtual formats and also just managing multiple responsibilities, how important that you all have hide, highlighted for us to lean into radical self-love and collective care to sustain ourselves in this work. And so what strategies might you offer folks uh, to give to new teachers, to continuing teachers, to care for themselves, especially in this moment as we are carrying so much? Find your people. You gotta hang out with folks who are like-minded, who will push you when you need to be pushed, and who will hug you when you need to be hugged, virtually, if, if that's what's necessary. And, um, you know, love you through this, this struggle. Um, get hooked up with organizations like Rethinking Schools, Teaching for Change, um, get on the zenedproject.org website, the Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference is virtual this year, right? There's so many conferences that in past we couldn't visit because of money, because of kids, because of whatever. This year, you know, obviously there's still the price of registration often, but there's also things that are, that are free. And, and so, um, you know, spend some time 
getting to those conferences because they are refreshing. You, you'll learn something, but it's also just, it just does my soul so much good to be around teachers who are, are fighting for, for me and my kids, you know, who, who are thinking of Caleb and Nehemiah as they uh, plan their lessons, even though they don't even know them. Um, so yes, that's, that's my advice. <clears throat> That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, we have um, this in the summer, we did um, a curriculum camp with the uh, Oregon Writing Project, and we specifically had um, a BIPOC, we called it BITOC, Teachers of Color instead of People of Color, but um, it was so important uh, to experience that week with my people um that you know so the following week when i had the regular staff meetings and all the oh take all of these trainings and get all these certifications in this one week before you start virtual learning um that wasn't relevant to my like feeding my soul it was more of like clocking in my requirements um it was so important and um the people who i meet when i do um camps like that or take workshops like Diane was saying, um, when I feel alone in my space, um, particularly at school, I know I have people who I can go and get that hug or be like, yo, guess what, you know, um, and have a real conversation and be, um, be myself besides the person who I am when I'm with the 25 to 30 kids that are in the room with me <laughs> or on the screen with me right now. Um, so like authenticity, but also find your people. Um, and then find that for me also, it's with the distance learning, it's making sure I'm aware of what my work time is and what my family time is. It's such an important balance when it's all in the same location and I may or may not still be wearing pajama bottoms. <laughs> it's like important to say, okay, yep, I'm gonna do this or I'm not gonna do this. Um, and I also find that like highly, for me, like what is your soothing, action what is the thing that you know like when you need to calm down from something or you need to do something what is what is that piece and remember it hold on to it because um our work is so personal to who we are that sometimes you just need that physical act i'm not gonna say eat because the quarantine 15 is real but anything else sweeping i don't know <laughs> chess puzzles <laughs> and humor <laughs> Wow, the quarantine 15, that was my first time hearing that, it's so real. Um, you know, and this is such an important question, Sierra, it's actually also a, a very important question for us to pose to our students because they're also wrestling with tremendous levels of stress and anxiety in this time right now. And I actually, and that's frankly, I think that's part of some of this anti-racist work. And I remember I asked them more recently what do they do to soothe and to calm down, to use Kara's language? And, you know, music just kept coming up. You know, they just talked about how it, it just hits me different. And I'm like, wow, like, and to think that how, how, how often do many of us even incorporate music in our classrooms and, you know, imagine impact it'll have on both them and us. Uh, and so in that vein, I just have to shout out, um, you know, an artist named Gregory Porter, who has a new, a new album out, an important jazz singer. Um, his music is just really holding me down right now. And I'm thankful to Okaikor, one of you know, the co-founders of the organization for putting that on my radar because uh, I, need, I need that kind of music uh, to keep me going. I, I don't know how else to sustain. Um, definitely got to collaborate with the fam, with the, with the crew, with the squad. Um, but you know, I, I meditate. Uh, this morning, you know, I was in between scrambling to like, get the final put the finishing touches on my lesson for today uh i said you know you know it's actually worth the time for me to just write out this poem that i had in my head and if it means that like i'm gonna lose 15 minutes of like lesson prep to do it i'm still gonna do it and just trust that the lesson that i do come up with at the end is still going to be all right and you know what it was <laughs> so uh I, I think that's that's super important um i, I see a therapist you know I um I pray with my family multiple times a week. Um, 
you know, I go out to lunch with my siblings. You know, it's 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 all of that. It's and I get it wrong sometimes too. Actually, more than sometimes, I get it wrong. And uh, and so I, you know, reflection and and going back and making those and reaching back out, like you know what, I think I I need to make an amends here. You know, asking for forgiveness, acknowledging our mistakes. I definitely don't want to promote some like bogus model of perfection out here. Um, the mistakes I make, uh, I made today are too numerous to count. So uh, I have to say that. I'll step back. Ooh. All of these strategies, I'm writing them down for myself, <laughs> trying to collect and curate all of your ideas so that I can use them as well. And I know so many folks have enjoyed this conversation and gotten so much out of the the strategies, out of the advice, out of the inspiration, the hope that you all have given us, but also the reality of this moment and what this moment offers us and how we can navigate this moment together. And so I wish that I could stay and on and talk to you all night because I know that I have so many more questions. But as we get to wrap tonight, uh, there will be an evaluation placed in the chat box. Please do fill it out so that we know what you have appreciated and what you would like us to do for next time as we continue to have these conversations. And so just a, a few key takeaways that I am leaving with from this conversation. I, I heard from Kara that curriculum is intentional. It's personal, it's political. As educators, we do political work, but we have to couple the curriculum with intentional relationships, as Diane reminded us, with skill and ongoing commitment. EK reminded me that we have to analyze power both historically and institutionally, and we have to lean on one another to organize. And as we talk about anti-racist teaching, Diane said anti means against, but what are we for? And I add this question of what are we building? And you all have shown us this tonight. We are building spaces of self-love, of relationships with other educators. Find your people, Diane said. We've called so many important names into this space. And we are all this wonderful tapestry of the people we've known, the students that we've learned alongside, and the knowledge that we've gained. And so all of the stories that we've collected and the stories that others have graciously offered us are an important part of who we are and what we bring to teaching, and we can't forget that. So let us build trust. Let us show up as our full self and how the panelists tonight have modeled this how we are building, how we are for freedom, we are for liberation, for justice, for joy, for laughter, for resistance, for vulnerability, for allyship and being co-conspirators, for grace. And we're for a world that allows us to show up exactly as we are and be celebrated for it. And a world that allows us, uh, allows the young people to show up exactly as they are and celebrate their beauty and the power that they bring to every space that they walk into. And so we have the power to do this. We can slow down, but we have to keep going. And so with that very exciting announcement, the new teacher book has an online workshop series and join the new teacher book editors, authors, and early career teacher scholars who wrote and shaped this book. Sign up for the entire workshop series, I highly recommend, or sign up for one workshop at a time. Some of the workshops include restorative justice in the classroom, teaching climate change, supporting LGBTQ plus students, and more. Space is limited, so make sure to sign up as soon as possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the panelists for all that they have shared, mm -hmm. the wisdom, the knowledge, the strategy, the advice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Appreciate it. Oh, and all those uh, behind the thank scenes you. folks too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Rethinking Schools. Thank you to the wonderful uh, interpreters who guided us through this conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you for thank making you. this space more accessible for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you. And so we would love your feedback. Please fill out the evaluation form that's in the chat box. We're going to be sending out a follow-up email with the code, with the workshop link, a link to the resources that were shared during the conversation in the chat box. And so please keep a lookout on your inbox. We look forward to staying in touch with you and let's keep doing this work.